I'm going to tell you a little bit about QuickCheck for Elixir. Uh, so it's an introduction. QuickCheck for Airline is already out there for a long time, and QuickCheck for Haskell was there before and after. Who of you is, is kind of familiar to the idea of property-based testing QuickCheck? Oh, look at that. that. That's quite a lot. So for those who are not, I will show you some kind of uh, test cases. I will do half a live demo. Always a bit scary, but uh, we will survive a lot. So <clears throat> most developers agree that writing tests is very useful. Right? It's very useful to write tests. No? Yeah? OK. So it, but also it gets very, very boring very quickly. Right? So that's why a lot of developers, they, they write a test, probably a tool, and then say, oh, let's do some fun stuff instead. And I will show you why testing is so boring, right? if you don't already know it. But let's assume that we want to test that the list sequence function in airline, which is an airline function, does exactly the same thing as the enum to list function in Elixir. Right? So I hope you know those two functions. Uh, and definitely you should know the enum to list and double and function in uh, Elixir. But you might know that there's also a list sequence function in Erlang. You don't have to care about it. If you develop some, something and you're new to the language but you know Erlang, you probably think, oh, those things would do the same. So let's test that they actually do the same. So how would you go about that? Well, of course, you will write some unit tests, right? And if you're an Elixir programmer, you would do that using a mix. Uh, project. So you write your module simple, you either use X unit case, and you write your, unit, your test case. So you get a good name, right? the things do the same, and you have some assertions, and you say, if I do list sequence 1 to 5 in Erlang, it should better be the same as lists enum to list 1 to 5 in Elixir. Right? That's just what it should do. And the same for negative number on the left, and positive number on the right hand side. And let's try a rather border case where I have a rather big number and a rather rather big number, but only should be one element. And then you can run those tests and they will pass. Okay, who of you is happy now about this test? None of you, exactly. Because all of you have in your mind one test case that I haven't written down here. So I often ask students to say, well, okay, now take pen and paper and write another test case that you would have added to the system. And if there are about 80 people in the room here, then at least 80 of them would come with a test case which is different from the ones here. I will probably get 60 different test cases that I then have to add to this suite. And the big, big question is, <clears throat> why do I use those values? Other people would take other values. And how many tests shall we actually write here? Now, for a developer, this is all far too much, right? As a developer, you don't want to sit there and think about another 60 test cases for this stupid function. After those three, you know it works. Or you probably come up with a fourth one because you all have one extra test case in mind. So, it's boring to come up with more. And you have already tested something, so why would you? I come from property-based testing. So instead of writing test cases, I say, well, the values that are used in those test cases, they are not so important. They are more or less randomly chosen. I chose those values because I thought they make nice test cases. They have some water cases, probably. I chose them with care, but it was not absolutely important that it was minus 10, 10. I could have chosen the test case minus 8, 8 as well. That's a random choice that I just had at that moment in time. So why not use that as a kind of a property of the software? So now we lift from, from test cases to properties. We say something far more general than those things of the, the different values. We basically say, no matter which values you give, it should always be the same. In Elixir, you write it like this. You use EQC X unit, that's a package <coughs> that comes with a check. And the property would be like a test. So it's not a test, but it's a property. Property airline sequence. Do for all n and n, which you take from the domain integers and integers. So this is mathematics. This is back to, to university, right? You have this question mark A on the upside down. For all those things, m and n, which are taken from those domains, it should better be the case that 
list sequence mn is equal to list of m double n. Now, this is equally much writing as this. Right? Actually, it's a bit less. But here you test all the cases, and there you test three cases. So I prefer this, because it's less work in the long run, and I do test more. This is a simple example, but this in general holds that you write less and you test more. So let's see what happens if I run those tests with mixed tests. And I switch out, and I hope things will work out fine. Reasonably fine, this should be in the bottom. So here I have my, my property. <coughs> it's called example.exs. That's probably not readable from the back, but this is my example. <coughs> it's exactly as I showed on the slide. Just before this meeting, I got an, uh, before this, this talk, I got the Elixir expert uh, advice on how to write the equals function. So it now actually displays nice on the screen as well. So this is a last minute thingy. Thank you, Martin, for helping me out there. Um, let's do mixed test of this example epc.exs. So in, in mixed test, you can run the whole test set or just one. And I have some more tests in that directory, so I only want to run the test example you see x this one. So what happens now is it starts quick check and it starts, it will say failing, failed, make it slightly larger, but you can read it in fact as well. It tells me that the test case failed here. The reason was that I got an exit message, a function clause, and this equals one minus one, that's all nice. And it says, after six tests, I found a test case for you which didn't match your property. Your property is not true. There is a failing test case demonstrating that your property is not true. The failing test case is then symbolized by one minus one. So that's the test case that demonstrates. But these are kind of random, this is a random path that Critchick traverses, so they might not be the minimum values that you so actually then Quickcheck is looking for smaller values, but which we call shrinking, and says zero minus one. That's the minimum value we can find for which your test case, for your property fails. And the reason why it fails is that if I do zero minus one in airline as a list, I get the empty list. Whereas in Elixir, I get the list zero comma minus one. And that was the equals thing that was in my property, showing this on the screen. Then I get, so this is all what the quick check output, and then here we have the kind of integration with mixed test, which I, I'm sure I can improve, but it will print you the property you have been testing, and it will print you the, the values for which it has failed. And this m and that m match to zero and minus one. It says if I do this property for that value, then things go wrong. Right? That's quick check in a nutshell. Instead of writing test cases and thinking, oh, what value should I use here? You will just generate automatically your values and you will see what happens. Cool. So that's one thing. Now we want to go back to my presentation. I hope that works. <coughs> so we did this, and we had our live demo, and a little bit of terminology. These things, the domain from which I take my, my data set, is called the generator because it randomly generates data there. And this whole thing is called the property. So, as you had seen, it will fail. It failed in a different case on the top there. There I had, after seven tests, I had a failing test case, minus one, minus two, which didn't give this exit message because that actually didn't crash the airline, but it gave another message, uh, and, but the lists were not, not equal, and that's the only thing I'm actually testing. And here I had a slightly older version of my printout, so I say there's a counter example, which is this one. Doesn't matter. So you will find different test cases failing your system all the time. Simple example. Let's do another simple example. Because it's always nice to learn by example. There is in Elixir a package called string, and there's a down case and an up case. Right? You, you know, have you seen those? Who's using down case and up case? If you put your hands up, good. Then you will know the answer later on. But what unit test do you think that people writing upcase and downcase have written? What are the typical kind of things that you write? 
Small a, uppercase, gives big A. Right? That is the right of right. One, uppercase, gives one. That's the other side. And then you come up with one more test case. But that's boring, right? And if you do all come up with one more test case, we have 80 more test cases. That's good. We get lots of test cases. And lots of test cases is probably a good way to, to test your system. But what is the property we can come up with? That's much more difficult. See? I mean, I fooled you before because that was a very simple property. Everyone can come up with that one. But coming up with the property is difficult. What would you do? You would do an upcase and a downcase. And then it would be the same as the original. Not always, not if you start with an upcase. So you're almost there. Almost there. So what you could do is idempotency. You do the downcase, and you would be really, 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 really surprised if, if you do the downcase twice, you get a different character, wouldn't you? That would be really surprising if you do that. So that's called idempotence in computer science. It says if you apply the function twice, you should get the same answer as the first time. You could do that. And of course, we have a, a, a generator for UTF-8 strings. And of course, QuickJet comes with the generator for UTF-8 strings, otherwise you could not test this very well. So this is the property. You take any UTF-8 string, you downcase it, and you downcase it twice, and the result should be the same. That's what we actually want to show. And then there's this live demo button here that I can press, and then I jump to my live demo, okay? So there we are. My live demo, and then all the windows are, of course, in different places, because that's how that works. So here we have the upcase, downcase. See? There you go. See? This is the function. Now we run a number of tests here. Uh, down, upcase, downcase, EPC. There we are. Slightly better. So is this readable from the back? I think it is. So I'm now going to do mix test with that property I have there. I will run it and I will pass a hundred tests. Beautiful. This function really works. I do another one, absolutely fantastic. Another one, another hundred test passes. And that's good because this is what we expect. Actually, we could do what you proposed to do something with the upcase here as well. So let's think about this. You take an arbitrary character, it can be an uppercase character, but then uppercase should not have any effect. So you take an arbitrary character, you make an uppercase out of that, you make a lowercase out of that, that should be the same as taking the arbitrary string or character, making it into a lowercase. Right? If I have something which might or might not be in lowercase, I make an uppercase out of it, and then I make a lowercase out of it. It's the same as just making a lowercase out of it straight away, isn't it? You all use this function. Is this true? No. No. I don't know. There are Unicode characters that are uh, like one character, lowercase, and three characters or more, or something else, in uppercase. Okay, so would it be better than to say uppercase and then downcase? Would that work better? It's all the same rubbish. So for people that didn't really notice that subtle difference like me, I would immediately get a failure, right? So I run a number of tests. I have to run 60 actually, that's a, that's a bit shaming. But I get this, these two characters are actually not the same as those two. Well, I can make it bigger as much as I want, you will not see the difference here on the screen. I think the screen doesn't really know to print the different characters. But then it, it shrinks a little bit and you find the minimum character for which they are different. And this is the minimum string, which if I make this into an uppercase and then back into a lowercase, it actually adds up here. Which is clearly the same, isn't it? I mean, semantically. Right? So that's what picture does for you. Don't care about your random values. Don't care about finding tricky test cases. Just give it the property you think should hold, run it, and find out that it doesn't. Right? And then you have to adapt your, your property to make it actually hold. And in this case, we don't really know what that property should be. Probably should put another uppercase around it and then say, this is fine, but 
is a bit tricky with human prokaryotes. Okay, so that's property-based testing. You write something, you think this should definitely be true, you run it, and you find out either that your software is correct or that you have misunderstood the software. This is all very nice, but in your software development, you hardly ever write this kind of simple code. This is stateless code, just doing something with data, and if you do it the second time, you get exactly the same stuff. Easy to write properties about, or probably not that easy, but at least you can write properties. But what if you have state? Oh, by the way, I did also print a few other examples, if, in case I wouldn't find it, right? So this is what I found yesterday. Kappa and Kappa are not actually the same, and Phi and Phi are not the same. These things are this nice, the liturgy of putting the Fs together is different. So you get nice, strange results there. But this is simple software. This is kind of stateless software. So how do we use quickly then in practice is we, we generate this data, and then we run 100 tests or more, but it's just a flag that you can set how many you want to run. And then you check that the property holds. And either the property holds, uh, and then you really have to check that you did test the right thing, or your property does not hold. And then you have to go into the debugging mode to make sure that you actually find out why your software doesn't hold. And sometimes you write, uh, you run more tests, like I did before, and say, oh yeah, right, and you can have those differences. Or you try another property, like we did as well, by changing the uppercase and the downcase. Or you trace the code and you say, this is why things don't work. So software has certain properties, and there's things that are should always hold for the software, and it's a little bit like requirements. And a test case is one verification that a certain property holds. And a property is basically saying, your requirement holds, because I tested all the possible cases. So that's what you want to do. But in real software, properties are, of course, far more complex. Real software has state. Properties need to be stateful, right? because otherwise it doesn't make sense. So how do you make a stateful property? How do you transfer this ID of generating data to the stateful world in which we live? Software which has state and you want to test. The thing is, instead of generating your data part, you generate a complete test case. So PicCheck will generate a complete test case for you, sequences of operations. That's what the, the thing is. So in your test case, are normally a sequence of operations. Start the system, do this, do that, do that, do that, do that, assert this, do that, assert that. That's your normal sequence. QuickCheck can make those sequences for you, and I'll show you how to do that. And then the thing you get for free is that when your test case fails, it shrinks, this random sequence is shrinking to a minimum failing test case, which shows you very clearly what the reason for failure is. And that, that's a nice thing to have, of course, because it makes it much easier to analyze why something is broken. A small test case saves you days of debugging. If, you, if you're given 100 commands and say, well, this doesn't work, or you get three commands and say, this doesn't work, it makes a lot of difference. Okay? So I'm going to demonstrate that by a very, very simple example. I'm not sure we, people have this thing, thingy in, in Poland or wherever you come from, but this is the thingy that I'm going to implement in software. This is called a ticket dispenser in English. The fact that they have a word for it means they have it there as well. <laughs> Sweden is full of those things. Right? Every shop has a ticket dispenser. And people have them to take a number and stay. They don't have them to stay in a line. Right? You can disorganize, stay in the shop, doing as if the others are not there. That's very important in Sweden. So you just take that number and you stay there. And then at the moment that the counter says you, it's your number, you jump in and that's your time. So, without that, the Swedish society will completely collapse. <laughs> it's a very important thing. You really need it. And this is why you have to implement it in software, because we have to go with our time, right? We can't have that in paper anymore. So we make an electronic version. It has two operations. The take operation and the reset operation. Sometimes it actually happens that you have too many customers. That's boring enough. But then you have to replace the role. Right? You open it, you put a new role in, and then you start from, from zero again. That's the reset operation. Simple. Any one of us can write some Elixir implementation to do that. But I wrote actually an airline implementation years ago. So 
probably I should test the Erlang implementation first, and then compare that my Elixir implementation is actually doing the same thing as my, my Erlang implementation. So that, that is a bit where I want to go for. So in Elixir test cases, you write, write something like this, right? This is a unit test case, for those of you that write those things daily, then you would immediately recognize this. This is a mixed X unit unit test case. You start with a module name, and then this is this is really cool in Elixir, and you could do this in Erlang as well, of course, but you can actually say which module you are testing by aliasing. And it, it, this, the top one is my Erlang implementation, ticket dispenser. The bottom one is a ticket agent. I was in San Francisco a while ago, and I hear Joseph Corset give a presentation, and I said, oh, I should actually implement this in Elixir as an agent, not as a gen server, because it makes more sense. So I implemented it as an agent, and I tested by starting the system, yeah, and I should get an OK back, and the process identifier of my dispatcher, I take a ticket and should return a one, right? Otherwise I would be surprised. Another one would be two, another one would be three, I reset the system, yes, I take another one, and I stop the system. Because now I've verified everything. I tested the reset operation, that works, and I tested my assertions, it works. Okay? This software is rock solid. <laughs> I tested it, and I tested all the APIs, and have 100% code coverage of my system. There is no way this software could not work. <laughs> Keep that in mind in the rest of the talk. So, what are we going to do? I, I can show you that the test actually passed, but that you will be fine. Let's do it. Let's do it later when we come to that. So now I have to make it kind of a, this kind of scripts automatically. I want to automatically make such sequences. And for example, I want a sequence where I have two resets after each other. Does that break the software? Probably not. Three then? Probably not. I want to have more asserts than just three before I do a reset. You can imagine there are lots of variations that you can think of. So you want to automatically make those kind of sequences with quick check. In order to do that, you write a quick check state key, as we call it. You make a state key which spots out those kind of sequences. That's the whole idea. And then the property that you run is that the sequences will actually be tests that pass the system. So you will, for each sequence, you will run it as a test case. And that's it. So, this is how that looks like. It's a bit more encoding now, right? It's actually more than this, this one test case, but you test much more, so keep that in mind as well. So, we include a few more files, among which ecc state m, and this is my property. And you don't see the, the command sequence generator, but I generate commands by using the present module, and I store them in my command sequence, I start the cert, like in the normal test case, I run my commands, which will be taken and reset. And since the command sequence depends on the, the bit of the started uh, process length file, of the started ticket dispenser, I give that as an argument to the test case. So the test case is then, while running, well, after generation, so first you generate it, and after generation I say, well, all the bits in my test case are this bit. So that there's no confusion about what I'm actually testing. And then I stop it, and then this practice commands will print the commands when, when you fail your test case. That's all it basically is. This is my property. My command generator looks like this. It's one slide. It's quite some text, but initial state is zero. I start in initial state zero. Okay? If I do a reset, then I well. I use my argument for the reset is the process identifier, so I have to take that from the state. I have to put in a bit, and I switch to zero in my model when I have done my reset. Reset will reset the state to zero. And the post condition is that I actually output a zero when I call reset. I get a zero value. Okay? My arguments for the take are, again, only the bit, because take really doesn't do anything else than just running the, the process. I take something from the bit, and what I do there is I increase this, increment the state by one. State plus one. That's the only thing I do. I increment my state. 
And the, the post condition is that I should actually, the result of the take is the previous state plus one. one. Yeah? So this is my model, and this will generate test cases. And as the put the my demo there again, so I'm going to do that. So, let me see. We are here, <coughs> slightly larger. Let me first run the test. Uh, it's called dispenser test, you can see. And that will run, that's this one test case that you've seen before, and that's of course passing. Now I run the property, and that will also pass. It will pass 100 tests. Uh, there's one test running 100 different sequences and zero failures. So that's fine. This works. What did I actually test? Let's go to the dispenser. You can see this is the code. Right? This is what I've shown on the slide before. It's actually the same, but as you can see here, I use my airline ticket dispenser to test. I haven't tested my ticket agent. I test the airline ticket dispenser. Let's test the agent. And I implant, I put a bug in there, just so you can see what happens, what that makes it more interesting. So now we want to test this one. Boom! My agent test fails. This is not a very interesting test case. Let's run another one where I can show something. Yes. So it fails, and it has run a reset, a take, a take, and a reset as a test case. That's not a test case you would come up with, right? But this is a random test case. A reset, a take, a reset, and a reset. Now, it fails because when the new reset, it gets a 1 back. And 1 is not equal to 0, because we expected the 0 back there, the model says. And then I shrink it to the minimum test case, where if I call this reset, I get a 1 back, but I expected the 0. So my agent is not doing the same as my airline code. Right? So I have to go into my agent code and fix that. So I go into my agent code. This is my agent. Oh, look at that. Someone introduced a 1 there instead of a 0. Reset should put it to 0 again. So we save it. We run our tests. And look at that. 100 test pass. And another 100 test pass. And you can get some output statistics about how many takes, how many put resets you do. We will, we will cover most of that. So that, that's fantastic. And you can do another 100 tests. You test all kinds of resets and, and takes at the same time. This is how you test stable software in a very simple example. Okay? So we jump to this situation where we have tested our agent very, very thoroughly, and we have invested in making this model. And this model was a bit kind of, I mean, I showed you a complete slide of code, and that most of you will not have understood the whole code immediately, because a whole page of code is hard to understand. But you can imagine, there was almost the same work as writing the actual agent, or probably even more. So, you have an investment made writing that state machine. Normally, you don't have to write the complete, model, uh, the complete kind of same implementation, because normally you take an abstraction level and say, oh, this abstraction level thing should work, and you don't bother about the details. But still, you have to write that state machine. That's an investment that you all have to do in order to get your automatic test cases. After that, you can run millions of tests and impress your manager, but before that, you still have to write that, that state machine. But my ticket dispenser was very, very simple. But now that we have an electronic ticket dispenser, we can actually use concurrency. Right? So we can have this on the web. You can, with your phone, get your ticket. That's cool. So you have a concurrent model. You could get in this situation where you do a reset, and then two people at the same time try to take your ticket. Take a ticket. And this one actually takes two tickets. You know how people that do that take two tickets instead of one? It's amazing. This one is just taking one ticket. Yeah? So you have a different situation. You have now made a fancy program which runs take ticket in parallel. And people can take tickets concurrently. 
How are you going to test this? Okay, let's write a unit test for this. Hmm. What about thinking of this as two false merging cars? Things that can happen is that either this one says, oh, it should not have, okay, it should have zero. This is an old version. But you get a zero back. And then this one gets a one. That one gets a two. And that one gets a three. That is like, this is the main motorway. People just drive through and don't let that poor car in. Yeah? That, that's what happened here. You could have also the, the kind of more polite situation where this one takes a one, that one takes a two, that one takes three. It's okay. That could happen. It could also happen that that one is actually pushing the gas, getting the front of all the other two, and that will work. Right? That's another possible scenario. But if you run this test in parallel, you would be really, really surprised if you see that this one and that one both get a one. Moreover, as I said before, this will collapse the society. <laughs> right? Because they both have the same number. This is not going to work. So what should we do? Well, we have to just run this, spawn two elixir processes, run them, right? collect the results and compare them. And if the results are 1, 2, 3, that's okay. If the result is 1, 3, 2, that's okay. If the result is anything else than, two, than those three possibilities, it's wrong. Something has gone wrong. You write that test case. That's fine. You can do that. And you manage that. Why do we only test this with two users and three takes? I want this one. And you go, oh! Right? How many possibilities are there? Just two. 30. Right? You see that immediately. 30 possibilities. Right? So there's 30 possible good outcomes and quite a few bad outcomes. So you have to find out what the good outcomes are and the bad outcomes are, and then you have to write your test case, spawning three elixir processes, but one of them is really just doing reset in the middle of everything. So you have to really think about what, how can I write this test case? And since there are 30 possibilities, and since this is still considered a small test case, you do not want to write a unit test for this. Yeah. Write a unit test for concurrency events gives you a headache. And people are naturally averse against headaches. So they avoid it, right? And they avoid writing your test for concurrency. If you really take any book about software engineering, from some of you who have said, no, no, no. You test concurrency later on. You don't do that in the unit test. You can't do it. It's impossible. Well, let's quick check do it for you. Okay? How do we do that? We have a model of the dispenser, right? It does a reset and a few takes. And you had a model which then updated it. If you did the reset in any state, you would end up in the state zero. And if you would, in that state, take, a, take one, you would end up in the state which has a one there, etc. So you have your model already. And you can check the real implementation against the model. So what happens if you now get parallelism? Well, the only thing you have to do is to compare the parallel sequence against your model. And the only thing that QuickCheck has to do is to say, is there a possible path through the events such that if you order the path, the, the events in that way, it's explainable by my model? I have already my model. So you could use that model in a different way now to actually find out that you can reorder the things such that it makes sense. And if it makes sense, then your application doesn't reveal an error. Okay? That's the whole idea. So you compare that against your implementation. So what do we have to do? in order to make this work for QuickCheck. Is this another lot of work? Are we going to spend another day? Not really. The only thing we do is we write parallel here and parallel there, and things will work. Because QuickCheck machinery will then know, oh, you are interested in parallel test data. We can generate parallel test data for you. We can compare that. That's no problem. And there's the live demo button, so I'm going to do that. So, parallel. Right. The di most difficult thing here, and particularly in a live demo, is to write parallel with the right amount of S's. Uh, sorry, or else. But I think it's like this. No, it's parallel. There you go. Thank you. So I generate parallel commands and then run parallel commands. Right? I save this, and there we go. Poof. 
in my Elixir code. This is not nice, is it? I have a long sequential prefix doing all kinds of strange things like takes and resets. And then I have two processes in parallel, one doing taking a two, and the other one also taking it. And they are both <coughs> at a two, end of the universe. They both got the number two there. And Quixel says there are no possible interleavings. I don't understand how this can happen, that both of them get a two. And that's true, we don't understand how that can happen. Not of the scripture. Of course, this is not very nice shrinking, is it? I mean, we started with a slightly larger test case, but the shrinking wasn't really nice. The reason is, parallelism is kind of relatively um, non-deterministic. So you, if you rerun the test in shrinking, you might not end up choosing the right shrinking path. So sometimes we really have to run it a few times. There's an always macro for that, where you can run the same test case several times, so you get much better shrinking. I see if it worked better now. Yes, it worked better. I get another test case here after shrinking saying, if I do the take in parallel, two takes, both can get a one back. But that is impossible. But it happened. So now we go into your code and say, why is that? Right? So you go to your, your agent and say, well, my agent should actually work. But then, ah, look, someone not knowing Elixir very well not having followed any kind of concurrency course, does it get, and then an update, and then returns the old value. And of course, there is a race condition between the two, right? So if you do this in one process, and then the other one's also there, and then both do the update, then this is going to break completely. That is why there is a get and update, right? That's the only purpose for that function. And of course, it will then have to return two values, n and n, n plus 1. And this one can, can go home, and that one can go home, and this one can go home, and it's almost like we will code again. Look at that. Get an update, given an n, returns n for the getter, and n plus 1 for the update. So there we go again. Save it. And let's see if this is better. Oh, look at that. We solved a concurrency problem in our code. This is how you find concurrency errors. After you've made the investment in writing the model, there's very little investment in actually testing concurrency. Good. That was the last part of the demo. Now I go to some concluding slides. We can use quick check for finding concurrency errors. I've shown how it is done, but this is a very simple example. We do this for large examples as well. One of the largest examples we have done so far with the Elixir quick check, not to speak about the other quick check, because there we have done 4G base stations, 5G base stations in car software, but for Elixir we have used eJabberD from Process 1. And Process 1 was interested in testing eJabberD hooks, so we made a model of that one. You can add hooks to your eJabberD. It's a distributed system. Everywhere you have modules running, and you can add hooks, you can take them down, you can change them, you can move them, so it's a distributed setting. How are we sure that this works? Right? So make a quick check model that actually tests all the combinations of updating and deleting and removing and, and make sure that things work. So you start a number of EJMD nodes, and then the nice thing is you shrink to the minimum number of nodes that are necessary to provoke a certain error. That's a nice feature there. And we tested the add, delete, the remove on all the nodes, and we remove on one node, and some running and get that. Also running, so we run all the hooks as well to make sure that we have to have the, the right hook. And we mock the actual hooks with the grid check framework. So we found a few issues, such as problems when handlers have the same name with different arity, things like that. You know, we always find something. And talk to Michael Lamont for process one if you want to have the gory details. So, in the summary, quick check then. If you have requirements, the requirements provide us the properties of the software, and quick check is a tool for going from those properties to generate test cases, automatically generate test cases to test the system against that. And it starts from a model that generates test cases. If you find a failing test case, 
that automatically takes that test case, shrinks it to the minimum test case that it can find, and presents that minimum test case. And this is necessary because normally you have a lot of noise in your test case, which is not important for the actual test case, but it's important to efficiently go through the state space. And that's what we do there. Less time spent on writing test code. You have to write a model, but you have an enormous amount of tests that you get for free. One model replaces many, many tests, and you get better testing, because we, we do all kinds of weird combinations you would never think about. And because of the shrinking, you spend much less time on diagnosing of the error when you actually find it. That was my presentation. So, uh, about the um, writing the model when doing uh, these test cases, you're actually somehow re-implementing your requirements, like you said. Um, <coughs> so, I remember from time at university, we did like these uh, uh, um, uh, simulations of uh, beam systems, and to validate that our calculations were correct, we would write the same simulation twice with a different approach, so a different mechanical approach. So it was very important that you didn't do the same calculation and you get the same results. Uh, is, it, is this here also important that your model follows a, a different strategy to do the same tests, otherwise? Yes, so it's a very good question. The question is basically about similarity of the model and the implementation. If you re-implement your implementation, you're doing all the work twice, and don't think that's smart. So the first thing you have to do is lift the abstraction level and put it on a different abstraction level. The other thing which is important is to indeed have a slightly different approach to it. Not a kind of operational approach, but more a kind of approach of if this is run, what has happened? What can I observe in happening? So your models are not really the same as the state machine that you would print. Right? Your agent code is sufficiently different from the model that you, that you write. And it's on purpose like that because you, you need a bit of that. But it's not equally important here because it depends a little bit on your application domain. But normally you have already, the, one of the things is running against the other. So you will find differences very quickly. But if sure, if you have the same kind of mindset for the one and for the other, you will probably make the same mistake. You will never find your error. That, that's completely true. So you have to lift abstraction and think slightly differently. That's true. All right, we're, we're out of time. Uh, if you need to uh, ask Tom some questions, feel free to see him outside after a break. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you.